Nice. So again, welcome again. Um, it is great to be here this morning. Again, we want to be, it's kind of an exciting day to be thinking, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little bit distracted. We're leaving for a little bit of Christmas tomorrow. And so even as we're talking about the distractions of the Christmas season, I've got some of those weighing on my mind. But, um, but really, I want to be talking and focusing us today on the Christmas story, the passage of Luke, and I appreciate so much reading it. Uh, who here, I don't want to put you on the spot, is that the first time you've ever read or heard Luke 2? If, if it is, that's awesome and it's cool and congratulations for me. Otherwise, this is kind of what I assume, this is my experiment. First, you're not going to raise your hand anyway, but um, most everybody is familiar with this passage, right? Luke 2, we love it. Um, it is the most detailed one of the Christmas story. Uh, we read it in our house since I've been growing up as a tradition since I was a kid. So that was a fun thing as a kid to read it, to practice it. And we kind of pass it along to some new readers and to some readers in our house. And it's, it was fun to do that for our little Christmas tradition. Um, and this is one of the coolest things. We've been talking about Christmas this whole month. And we've been approaching it this year kind of in this theme of being surprised by the Savior. That's not just a title, but as this common theme of people being shocked, surprised to hear this news. So we started with um, Zechariah, who wasn't necessarily be hearing about Jesus, but he was shocked and heard about um, God moving through his son to prepare for the Messiah. And so he was surprised. Mary was the next one. Uh, so there's these surprise responses to Jesus' birth of all these people, and uh, you can see this will be a little quick review. Mary, who gets this surprise and responds with a song of praise of God's mercy and His justice, that's in Luke. Then Zechariah, um, he gets the chance to respond. He has this disbelief first, but then a second chance to prophesy about Messiah, God's promised one. That's in Luke 1 as well. And then Joseph was last week, and Joseph gets this surprising news as well about a son that's not his, but that his wife is going to carry, that is going to be the Messiah as well. Um, and he responds with this humble and honorable obedience to God's plan. So there's these people, they're just being surprised. God's speaking, God's moving, and they're shocked by it, but then they respond well, and then, so we finally, but all those stories, as you think about those are the Christmas stories, those are all stories about the preparing for it, right? This is all the expectation stories. It's the news of the conception. It's news of, of a baby. Today's the actual day, right? And so that's kind of fun that today is the Christmas Eve. It's like upon us. It's the actual day in this narrative of the Bible. Luke 2, we get the actual event of Jesus' birth. And this is really the most details we get. And as I was thinking about this a little bit, um, and as we've been looking at these, this is not just, um, we anticipate this event, but this is not just a birthday, right? Hopefully we know that this is not just, you know, people will say, well, what's Christmas? Don't forget it's about Jesus' birthday. It's Jesus' birthday, like, don't, don't make it about presents. There's this birthday. But let's not forget that besides the birthday, like, that's a cool thing. This is the birth, this is the foundation of our faith. This is not the founder of our faith, this is the incarnation of Christ. God himself coming to earth, the second person of the Trinity taking on humanity to provide salvation. So it's not just, oh, don't forget it's a birthday. Don't forget it's the, this guy's birthday. This guy is the creator, was at creation and is now here taking on humanity, joining the human experience. And so it's an incredible event. And yet, something I think about in this, as I'm like reading it and studying it, and it's familiar, it's this incredible event. How many details are really left out of it? Have you guys thought about this ever? Have you ever wondered? Has anyone watched a Christmas movie of like the Christmas story? There was one like The Star recently, with, that was an animated version of it. And then there's, I think there was the Jesus film had a nativity, right? Well, oh, there was one just a few years ago. It was really well done. What was that one called? Shoot. 
I forgot, but it's a good one. Go look up that one. There's a new one coming out this year. Um, but anyway, they, there's a lot of these that we like to speculate about the Christmas story, and it's usually based on this. So there's traveling, there's Mary and Joseph, there's these details. But I've thought about this, as I've thought about this, we put in a lot of details. Has anybody asked some of these questions? Every year there's, at Christmas time, there's some of these things, like, was Jesus really born in a barn? Or was it, maybe it was actually a cave, you know, because that's where they kept animals, was a cave. Or, I heard this recently, it was maybe not either of those, and the innkeeper, there wasn't space in the room, it might have been a family member's garage animal area. So, you know, that's where his family and extended relatives. So there's like a lot of speculations. Which one was it? Was it like, okay, I don't know. I'll be honest. And so here's the thing. We speculate a lot of these things. The main idea that we need to know really is that, right, it was a very humble beginning. It was not anything that got a lot of fanfare, right? But we also asked all these questions, you know, how, what was the labor like? All these interesting questions we speculate. But as I was thinking about it and reading this, I thought, you know what? What's interesting, the Bible we speculate on a lot of things that the Bible doesn't talk about, and yet what it actually spends time on, what it actually talks about, is what we should prioritize and pay attention to, right? I mean, I think that's important to say, wow, that'd be interesting to see what it was like. Is it, were there lots of shepherds? Were there a couple shepherds? Were there, you know, was it a nice barn? Was there hay and things like that? Or was it a, well, it ends up, the Bible spends a lot of time and it talks interesting enough about shepherds okay this is that last group of people that was surprised by the savior that was learning about messiah's coming the christmas story luke 2 doesn't talk a ton about jesus actual birth which i think is the miracle right that would be the thing i would love to hear the labor i'm sure it wasn't five minutes long right well what's what do we know about it while they were there time came The baby to be born, she gave birth to her firstborn. That's all we need to know about that. They wrapped him in clothes, laid him in a manger. There was no guest room available for them. That's the first half. Okay? But this unexpected group gets a lot of focus on the Christmas story. And so we want to look at them, really, and talk about them. So the explanation gives us this historical context. It gives us what we need to know about Jesus' birth And what's really cool to see, it may not look like it, but as the day finally comes, the circumstances around Jesus' birth are perfect. You may not think so, but they (laughs) end up being perfect. What do we see there? Uh, We'll read it again. But Luke 2, 1, 2, and 3 talks about it and says, Those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree, a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, It was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their hometown to register. Joseph went up to the town, to Bethlehem, the city of David, where he belonged to the house of David. So these, what's interesting is that these annoying, I put circumstances around Jesus' birth, but these actually are annoying circumstances around Jesus' birth, end up being perfect. They play right into God's hand because God has a plan for it. And so even though it's Roman rulers who are, look like they're just trying to count people and get money from them, taxing them, undesirable travel, that's all part of uh, the thing about our lives, right? We deal with these things in our lives too. Rulers that we have no control over, taxes, undesirable travel, you'd think these would be, man, these are junk. This is not what we would want to be part of. This, these, what would you think of random and inconvenient details? They work as part of God's plan. What is God's plan to have Jesus be born in Bethlehem? And why is that an important thing? The Old Testament promise, right? That the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, the city of David. He would be a descendant of David. Okay? So without even trying, Mary and Joseph are able to to fulfill God's promise as God wants it to happen. So these finally comes, and it's kind of fast, to be honest, right? That's that's all we see there. And then it shifts scenes. Luke 2, 8 through 14 is the next scene, really. You would expect 
after reading that the Savior is born. This is a big deal. This is important stuff. Um, but as you're reading it, there's no room for them. They, they have the baby. And it's a narrative that just shifts scenes right away. The, the readers of this, the original readers, probably did not expect this to go from the Savior's born to there's shepherds living in the fields nearby. Um, but that's exactly what they do, and that's exactly what God wants us to know. It's like, hey, by the way, this happened. This happened just as I planned it to. And now I'm going to give a surprising birth announcement to a group of people that would not expect it, that you would not expect to be getting this announcement. And that is shepherds. And so what does it, shepherds have to do with this? Well, absolutely nothing. <laughs> but it's who God wanted to tell And so we need to learn and pay attention to what he interacts with them and does with them, this birth announcement for them. So what does it say? You could almost, some of you guys might be able to recite this yourselves. Okay, they're definitely an unexpected audience, but this is what it says. There are shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over flocks at night. An angel appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. That's pretty, first of all, it's a pretty stunning announcement. But first, we want to go back to it, that it's an unexpected audience. Okay? I think this is important that, they, that Luke and that God himself wanted us to compare the two people. Starting this passage starts with really important political figures. Right? There's Caesar. He's the, the, the owner, if you would, the lord of the entire Roman world, the authority figure for the whole Roman world. He starts the story. But that's not really who it's about, and it's not important what he does. He's just a cog in God's plan. Okay? His plan to tax the entire world that he thinks he owns, he does own it. And that's what God's letting us know is like, within that, there's something more important happening. Okay? So the shepherds are not an impressive group. If we've, we've romanticized them. We like them now. We think shepherds are great, which they are. They're the first witnesses to, to God's to Jesus' birth, but look, these guys are, I want to point out each time, they're not an impressive group. They are simple, working class, night shift at the wool factory guys, okay? That's who the shepherds are. And so their evening is just working. They're not expecting anything different that night, and this, instead, they get the surprise of their lives, okay? Okay? So the heavenly being shows up to them, sounds like the sun, right? Scares them half to death, okay? But what were they really afraid of? So they probably got a little bit of jump scare from a person showing up, right? A bright figure showing up in the sky with them. But what are they really afraid of? This is kind of an important thing. Why should he say, do not be afraid? Well, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified, the glory of the Lord is what they're, <laughs> they're terrified of. And that's a good reminder for us. An appropriate response to seeing the glory of the Lord, of God's glory, should be fear. Okay? Terror is an appropriate um, response to that. But the angel says, don't fear, don't fear. I have a message for you. And this message of the child is one of those things that I would love to have gotten more detail of that I would speculate. I kind of speculate, did he just say these words? Is this a direct quote or was there more of a message? But this is what they recorded. That's what they made sure to remember. Regardless, this is the important thing of the message, right? Good news, great joy for the people. But what's the message here? Verse 11, it says it. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. So they would know Bethlehem, A Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And then he gives, this will be a sign. You'll find the baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. 
This is where I, I, I look at that message and I think, okay, so he's giving the message to the shepherds. I want to see what he's going to say. This is going to be really, really dense. This is going to be super like, I mean, they leave their jobs to figure this out. There's, there's got to be a lot to this, right? And it's like, well, verse 11 looks like it's not very much that he says. Today in the sound of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah of the Lord. It seems like such a simple thing. It's small. It's short, right? The angel's message, though, <laughs> there's three words in there. Did you catch the three words that he gives? Because it's almost so fast that you don't even notice. It's like, well, a baby born. But these <laughs> messages end up being incredibly important of what he's announcing. Because they know then, okay, a baby has been born, but this is not just a baby. Okay? So let's like, and I'm, you can who have been who came up, and you guys hear details and you hear good stuff. What are the three words from that angel's message of the child? What is it that he's saying about that baby in verse 11? Today in the town of David, what are those? Okay, three specific words. Oh, they're there already. Shoot. You guys cheated. Okay. He's the Savior. He's Messiah, the Lord. Okay, and, you, and we hear these words at church all the time, right? Yes, yeah, Jesus is Savior, Messiah, Lord, Christ. All these words sound good, and they kind of blend into becoming church words, right, that don't have a lot of meaning if we're not careful. But these words are incredibly important. So I had to look them up. Savior is the word soter in Greek. What well, we get, uh, the bigger word, soteriology, which is a deliverer from trouble, a Savior. So this is a common thing. People were looking for saviors all the time, the person who saves from trouble, okay? And, and interestingly enough, there's a pretty common Roman statement at that time that says, hey, savior, sorry, Caesar was the savior of the world. Caesar, the guy, who, the president, right? He's the guy who saves Rome, and he's going to save us from trouble and all these things. So there's a common statement at that time that says, look, Caesar is savior, but the angel says, look, a Savior has been born. This is the Savior. This is the Savior, the deliverer from trouble, the one. Okay? This is contrasted with that Roman one that says, look, a baby has been born. He's the one who's going to save. The second one, the second word is Messiah. And that word is Christos. This is where we get Jesus Christ, Jesus Christos. That's not really his second name or last name, if you kind of think about it, right? But we call him Jesus Christ because the name Jesus, we learned last week, was a common name, right? Yeshua, the God saves. God is... But Christos, that's the title of the promised one of God. That's the Messiah. That's the one that went through the whole Old Testament talking about the promised one, the Messiah, that would fulfill God's promises to his people. That's the Christos, right, a Savior, Messiah, has been born, and the Lord, right? He is the Messiah, the Lord. And the Lord is the word kyrios, not curious, like I'm wondering about something, but this is kyrios with a K-Y-R-I-O-S, if you transliterate it. Kyrios, Lord, is the supreme authority, okay? That is the word. So these three together, Savior, Christos, the Lord. This is more than just three words, church words. These are saying, wow, this is, this is big. This is, the shepherds probably didn't understand it fully, but they said, hold on, the Messiah, we know a little bit from our, you know, from our Hebrew classes and from our Jewish Sunday school to know that the Messiah is a big deal. He's going to save from trouble, and he's the th supreme authority in our lives. That is a big deal. This is a good message. This is a great message that he would give them to these, um, to the shepherds. And I've thought about this too. If that would be the best message and a fine place if I was writing the Bible <laughs> to end that, for the original readers to just say, look, the Savior's been born and he's announced to these shepherds. God has come. He's been born he, to live with humanity. That his mission his earthly mission has begun, All right? And, and if it was me, I could jump to now the rest of, you know, John the Baptist and things. 
And yet, um, like the earlier narratives, like the stories of Mary and Zechariah and Joseph, it's important to see how these guys respond to the message that God is at work. And so the next verses talk about the shepherd's response to the announcement. I think that's such an important thing. It doesn't just tell you God is working, God is doing something. Then he says, now, what to do next? And so the cool thing that we see is that the shepherds respond to that announcement in verses 15 through 20, right? And what does it say? They, when the angel left, the shepherds said, let's go to Bethlehem, see what's happened, what the Lord has told us about. They hurried off, found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they'd seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which was just were just as they had been told. So as it looks like to me, there's four specific Uh, reactions, responses that the shepherds had. So the first one, verse 15, it says they decided to confirm the the angel's message. They talk amongst themselves. They're like, hey, that was wild. But thankfully, they didn't just say, okay, that was crazy. Praise God, he's doing something. They said, hey, they let us know about it. Let's go see for ourselves, right? They wanted to confirm that message. Verse 16 They decide to go. Verse 16, they go. They go and find the child in haste as well, right? They hurried. They they didn't get subs and everything else. They just said, we're out of here. Found him lying in the manger, just as has been said. And then the second, the last two pieces, what do they do? They spread the word, right? When they saw him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about the child. They saw, they said, yep, that is... Amazing thing, they didn't say, okay, wow, an angel made an amazing announcement, the Messiah is born, and then they see the baby and say, well, that looks like a normal baby, right? And say, well, oh, I guess, I don't know. No, they said, okay, that looks like a normal baby, but we have confirmation from an angel that says, that is what? Messiah, the Savior, the Lord. This baby, we got to let people know. And so what did they do? They went and showed amazing those people who heard. And then the next thing, they, which interestingly enough, it seems like they repeat that. Because what does it say again? The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. Um, it sounds like they, they went and told everybody, but then what's 20? They're telling people some more. Glorifying and praising God is, is doing it out loud again, right? So... It's an amazing thing to see. Like they give this, again, returning, repeating this, an out loud, outward glorifying of God, praising Him for what they've seen and heard. And it's contrasted, right, with Mary, which is not, no offense to Mary, right? She's internalizing. She's allowed to do that, by the way. She isn't allowed to inter- ponder these things in her heart while the shepherds are going out and telling everybody. So it's a crazy thing to see, look, these responses. We have Mary, we have Zechariah, we have Joseph, right? Mary giving the song of praise, Zechariah a second chance to prophesy about Messiah, Joseph with the humble and honorable obedience, and then the shepherds, unique in their way too. What do they do? They witness, they share, they praise God, right? These are these responses to the news of Jesus, to hearing about God in flesh, God's incarnation. And so I love that we get these pieces, how to respond, such a focus on how do we respond to God's good news of Jesus coming to save people. And so um, as we look at these shepherds, I just wanted to look at applications for us specifically. Okay, this is kind of the last piece that we want to look at because it's such an important thing, though, for us to not just take them and say, wow, that was cool for them. Neat to see them do it. We need to put this into practice in our own life. And so there's applications for us from the shepherd's experience. Um, To look at those for ourselves, what are some lessons we can learn from them? 
Well, the first one for that we can learn from the shepherds is that God may interrupt your day to day. Okay? Like he did with Mary and Joseph, what seems like an inconvenient thing with, with having to move, having to travel, having to do all these things, God might interrupt your normal lives. Mary and Joseph's lives were completely interrupted, not at all what they had in mind, what they would plan, and yet what we saw from them was a submission to God's will and God using them incredibly. And so, and then with the shepherds too, right? He might interrupt your day-to-day They went to work that day just expecting to go to work. And yet, they get to be the first, what is it, witnesses, right? The first missionaries, if you will, okay? So the question for us is, how do we respond if God calls us? It might interrupt us. Well, the second piece is to tell others what you have seen and heard. This is a privilege that we can do. The shepherds spread the word that would have been told by the angel Their message was simple, as I think about it. They really didn't, it doesn't say, give a ton about it. It just says they told what they had seen and been told. Uh, And I think about this with my own own challenges. I I would say, look, we got to let people know about Jesus, right? This is an important thing. It's changed our lives. We want others to know that as well. And yet, I think about it, sometimes we overcomplicate it. Young and old, and I love having the kids here today because young people, you guys, sometimes might think, and I think about this too, young people and old people think, I have to know the right answer exactly before I can share Jesus with somebody else. Right? Like, okay, what is every possible question that someone might ask me if I share the... Like, hey, I want to share with you about Jesus, and now I need to know every potential question that they have about him before I can actually do that, before I'm ready. And, and, and I'll be just to tell you, like that cripples us, and it's not true to say, hey, you do not have to be the expert in everything to share Jesus with the people around you. Right? That's a great lesson we see here. The shepherds God used as the first missionaries, the first people, and what did, what's the response to them? People were amazed. Right? God shows that we can simply share our experience with Jesus. Jesus saved me. I knew I was a sinner. I, 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 he hit me over the head with it at one point. I didn't believe for the longest time. Now I do. You guys, Jesus died for my sins. And, and, and to be able to say, you know, share your, what you have seen and heard. You don't have to necessarily be an expert. Right? Because the third piece, what is it? God is pleased to use humble witnesses. He chose to use shepherds who are not the elevated, who are not the eloquent, who are not anything really special. And he yet specifically says, I want to use these guys to let the world know that I've come. And so that, to me, is an encouraged thing. Humble in, in status and in uh, attitude. Right? That's God uses. And so it's a great thing to see um, these things for us. God might interrupt your day. All we need to do is tell others what we've seen and heard because God is pleased to use humble witnesses. That's an exciting, good thing. So um, as we think about this, as we still have many opportunities this Christmas season to do that, go ahead and, again, don't just bring them in and say, hey, don't forget it's Jesus' birthday. Take it that next step of saying, and man, isn't it such a great thing what he is? Um, Let's ask for his help as we close even just now, as we're living life to do that, to to (laughs) embrace God's incarnation, that he came to die to save sinners that we all were. So uh, let's pray. We're going to sing one more song just to show our appreciation to, to... to him. So let's pray this morning as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story, a familiar one, uh, but God, such an important one for us to know that you came to earth. You came to earth as Savior, as Messiah, the promised one of, of history, Lord, the Lord, the ultimate authority 
for our, our lives, that you came, God, um, and you showed yourself to humble people is still such an important thing for us to remember now, that uh, if we respond to you in faith, if we trust you, God, that you change our lives as well, that you bridge that gap, that you make um, a relationship with you a reality. And so we thank you for that. We just want to praise you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.